So, uh, namaste. Uh, my name is Vaksha, and I work for an organization called in, uh, Center for Soft Power. We are a platform under Indic Academy um, that focuses on our Indic culture and our knowledge systems. So, what our uh, platform does is basically talk about the global appeal of what India has. So, Indian soft power can include Ayurveda, yoga, cuisine, films. Our uh, sports and everything, our Indian knowledge systems. Indian knowledge systems can include Kolam, Vedic mathematics, so many other things. Our science and technology is also Indian soft power, diaspora is Indian soft power. So we focus on promoting um, Indian soft power through our magazine. So we run a magazine uh, called Center for Soft Power, you know, it's called Indica Soft Power, uh, where we cover interviews and commentary articles. But also we do a lot of conferences, we do a lot of webinars every month. Uh, so we have an Indian and a non-Indian talk about the exchange of cultures. So we, you know, this is what we have been doing for the past four years. And uh, so that, that's basically it. So we wanted to interview you because, you know, you've done such wonderful work on the Gita and an Indian diaspora working on our Indian heritage. is just, it's really wonderful. It's very lovely to see that. Uh, thanks, Varshaji. Thanks for selecting uh, me for this yeah. uh, wonderful uh, uh, session. Um, so, um, should I? Okay, I could just tell a bit brief about myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes, uh, my academic position is a senior lecturer in uh, uh, data science at UNSW here. I'm actually based at the School of Mathematics and Statistics, but I'm not a mathematician, I'm a computer scientist. So by profession, and um, I was hired in by this school in 2020, mostly to teach uh, data science related uh, courses and machine learning and artificial intelligence is my specialty. So uh, yeah, so my research, the research in natural language processing that focuses on Bhagavad Gita and Upanishads and all these related works, that is something that I started doing here at the UNSW. So this is not something I did during my PhD, postdoc, or prior appointments than UNSW here. So that's uh, briefly about me. And uh, basically, I have been interested in um, uh, arts and literature. I'm a, I'm a movie uh, person. I watch a lot of movies. And I would claim that I watch more I have more movie time than an average person, for sure. And I've seen probably more Indian movies of various languages than an average Indian, you know. So you name the language, I have seen the movies, you know. So I do spend a lot of time with uh, Indian art and literature. And I am also a poet. I have uh, edited uh, poetry collections and I have uh, two major poetry collections of my own. And they are in Amazon uh, web store. And uh, so, and uh, when I was uh, young, I wanted to be an artist, a fine art student, but in Fiji. So I come from Fiji. I did my PhD in New Zealand, and then I worked as a lecturer in Fiji. I did my postdocs in Singapore and University of Sydney here in Australia. And uh, yeah, when I was uh, in my primary school or high school, I, earlier high school, I wanted to be an artist, a fine artist, you know, somebody who makes paintings. And I have been uh, naturally talented to work in that area. And I, I do paint from time to time, but I couldn't get a formal education in that area. So I became a computer scientist. <laughs> yeah, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm an unsuccessful uh, artist, basically. In that <laughs> <sense>. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's, it's always there in you. The art is always in you. <laughs> And you just have to nurture it every day. Yeah. So that is that why you you worked on the Gita because you know you are you're a poet yourself. Yes. So, so yes, the, I'm a poet myself. But I have been in, initially I have been heavily in, influenced by English poetry. So when I was doing my undergraduate, uh, so this is my early twenties. I used to go to the library, study English literature during my breaks. Uh, Tennyson, Wordsworth, um, W. B. Yeats, and yeah. others. You know some of my favorite poets back then. And uh, I come from a, uh, yes. Uh, Hindu family and my dad was very religious and also my mom is very religious 
so my dad was uh, uh, yeah so he uh, he was quite interested in religion not from a devotional perspective but more from the philosophical side of things so he was taking a lot of interest in uh, uh, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana series. So I, I, I remember growing up with, uh, you know, videotapes. Dad used to buy videotapes. We are right. from a very poor farming background, but dad, whatever profit he used to make, he would go and buy videotapes of Ramayana and Mahabharata and keep in his collection, right? And every year we'll watch it. So I grew up watching it over and over again, the Mahabharata and Ramayana. So these were at the back of my mind. And then... Um, I came into school and then I, I somehow in, towards the end of my high school, I started writing poetry or I didn't, you know, um, was not good. Uh, I did not prepare well for the other sections in the English uh, exam in my right. year 12. So I attempted the poetry section and I got full marks in that form. Oh. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, maybe I know poetry. <laughs> <laughs> and then my teachers, so there's uh, Mrs. Reddy, so she really motivated me. And I had another teacher, Mrs. Sangeeta Sharma, if I recall properly. So this is my year 12, 13 teachers. They really motivated me uh, to write, you know, and I started writing a couple of poems back at my end of the high school. And then my university days, I wrote more. And towards the end of my university, as a, I, I did publish my first poetry book. So, but that I was heavily influenced by Western uh, or English poetry. And I was, uh, I knew about the Mahabharata, Ramayana, that these are nar and larger narrative poems, but I was not taking, uh, being serious about them. And uh, the thing is the whole uh, Hindu awakening within me came about when, uh, I, at the age of 22, I left Fiji and I was a teaching assistant in a Middle East Technical University in, in Northern Cyprus, in Turkey. So I was there in that culture. So it's a, a Muslim country where you don't have temples and all sorts of these things or even. So, so I was in a culture shock. And people were asking me, my friends there, uh, I had some Pakistani friends, Turkish friends, and uh, African friends, and they were asking about Hinduism, you know? And I was yeah. like, okay, I should spend more time so that I can understand, explain them better. I, I knew about the, the texts, you know, but I did not know where they fall. What is the historic, you know, we, we have in Hinduism, what is mythology, what is epic, what is yeah. philosophy, you know? We have a library of texts, you know? So that's when I started taking interest in the Bhagavad Gita and reading the Upanishads in English because I knew the Hindi and Fiji Hindi, our Fiji Hindi is slightly different from in the Indian Hindi. Hindi. Yeah. It's more Awadi and Bhojpuri, right? So, yeah. so it's like uh, another language, I would say, you know, like, uh, so, but we also in our high school, we uh, study Hindi in Fiji. I mean, uh, our primary school. So I did my Hindi in my primary school up till year grade, uh, eighth grade. And my teachers, so my primary school teacher was so a devout Hindu. And he, we were doing every morning school prayer. I was the school I went to is so called Saraswati oh, Primary School and Saraswati nice. College, you know. So the foundations were all laid there. Yeah. And, and so we have a large uh, portion of Hindu schools, you know, probably 30, 40% Hindu schools in Fiji, you know. And uh, when we were growing up, probably the Hindu uh, Fiji Indian population was uh, more than 40%. Probably now it's slightly less than 40%, 35 to 40% so right. Hindu population. But uh, yeah, so it's uh, Fiji is a uh, mini India and you will yeah. see that uh, if Fiji Indians are really proud to be Indians generally. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a lot of respect for our motherland. We have our Hindu ceremonies. We celebrate Diwali, Holi and all those festivals. So these things were uh, motivating me to do some research where I actually can bring this type of work into academia. Yeah. Right. Okay. So how did this idea about just the Gita like arise for you? And why so, the Gita okay. really like specifically did you choose? Okay, so okay, a bit of a bit of context. So uh me and uh, my my good friend Tom, Tom Blow, he's a he's a he's a 
Israeli Jewish in Australia. And he came here a while back. And then me and him, we met in, 20, we were part of the same workplace. And in 2019, we, I realized that he has interest in the Mahabharata. So what we did was like, okay, let's have our own reading group. So every week, me and him uh, would read the Bhagavad Gita, you know? Yes. So and that would, uh, yeah. So then we started in 2019. And, uh, and this was when I was at the University of Sydney. And then we, from time to time, some interns from India were coming, some other people were coming, and we would invite them to a reading yeah. and discussion. So this 2020, I moved to UNSW. So we continued this with our Zoom uh, you know, uh, meetings. So we had more people now joining in. And uh, then uh, when we got more people joining in from 2020, then we were like, okay, let's go back to the Bhagavad Gita because we read it already. And then now we are reading it again. And then we said, okay, let's have a few translations. And there are PDFs of certain several translations on the internet of the Bhagavad Gita. Right. And then we started comparing text by text, you know, verse by verse when we are reading. And, and the thing is that none of us know Sanskrit. I know Hindi, but not that good. Uh, so we were always comparing the verses and like, what are the authors really meaning? You know, how close are these verses? These questions were there, you know? So we had the Mahatma Gandhi's uh, uh, translation uh, uh, and we had Shri Pruhit Swami's uh, translation. And then we had uh, Ignat Eshwadans. And Ignat Eshwadans translation was the one that I was introduced to the Bhagavad Gita when I was back in uh, Northern Cyprus, you know, like that's the first one that I read, you know, in English. So, and the Hindi ones, I mean, I've heard priests reading and stuff, but uh, like our Fiji Hindi, I mean, although we've been to the school, you know, system, I mean, the, the, the Hindi style in the Bhagavad Gita translation is very dense, you know, I mean, it's hard to get, there are a lot of words like, mm -hmm. You know about there's so many different scientific concepts, uh, philosophical concepts, and if it's in Hindi, we we in Fiji as a Fiji Indian, I think I'm thinking in English, and English is an easier language to yeah. me True. than than Hindi. You know, uh, although I hate saying it, but <laughs> uh, um, it's it's a it's kind of sad, you know. And I think the current Indian government is trying to, is realizing this fact that we have a youth, young generation of people who do not know their own language, although they've been through school in yeah. these languages, because our, the main key textbooks are written in English and our thinking has been changed, you know? Yeah. So if, if Hindi was not just a subject, but it was something that I was educated in, uh, as now the uh, Modi government is trying to do getting MBBS yeah. in textbooks in Hindi yeah. and things like that. So those yeah. things basically will give us more empowerment about our language, but we didn't have that. So now yeah. we have like a series of uh, you know translations, and we are trying to understand. And so going back, then we, me and Tom and some other colleagues, uh, friends of mine, who mostly scientists, we have a group yeah. of like seven, eight people now. And we all have been debating, uh, you know, uh, because some of the translations like Mahatma Gandhi Ji, he says uh, karma, where Shri Purohit uh, Swami says action, you know? Yes. And, and so there's all, always a mix of Sanskrit uh, with English and it depends on the authors. So we have been talking about those things, but then there was always a desire for me. Uh, I, I'll be selfish. Uh, I'll be frank, I, there has been a selfish desire in me to kind of have a paper with something to do with Hinduism, you know, like <laughs> rather than just, rather than being an academic, right. writing so many papers in AI and all these things and nothing to actually contribute to my own culture and my own heritage. Right. So then basically I said, okay, let's, so I had some interns from India who were interested to do natural language projects processing projects and I started my course teaching my course where in one week I was giving nature language processing examples so this is 2020 because I haven't done that type of research before yeah. then I started uh, you know looking more and then we had this uh, COVID data set that came across yeah and we're like okay let's look at sentiment analysis uh, uh, with this COVID data set and how you know the peaks as the peaks of peak is rising in COVID-19 yeah. How, how does that basically 
what type of sentiments are being expressed you know as people are getting you know so much of negative news what type of things do they express on twitter and uh, surprisingly uh, it's we found that uh, people have been joking a lot you know so uh, as people and it's it's very common right this is a human uh, how our human psychology has been built when you are like really afraid you make jokes you know and you have <laughs> we see this in movies or when people are scared you know when talking about ghosts and spirits for example in a dark room people will make jokes right and uh, we have seen this in social media and this is like a interesting find uh, with our twitter sentiment analysis project so we went further on and then we did another project where we use sentiment analysis we look at uh, biden versus trump during the presidential election and what type of sentiments people have been ex expressing and how that relates to the election outcome. So we did a paper on that. So um, my co-authors, my students were brilliant and these are from India and students who take took three months uh, internship, did three months internship with me because they were simply locked, you know, during COVID. And during my three years at UNSW, I have supervised more than 30 students, 30, 35 students as interns. And half of them at least got some sort of co-authorship in some papers. Now there are a lot of them are working in uh, top companies in India, some are migrating as well. And these uh, students, and this is a, it's a special uh, moment for me in my career, where students are locked up, we have uh, you know sessions and we talk about things, we motivate each other, they are motivating me, I'm motivating them. And then we try to look at uh, various topics and then, uh, with the, my reading group going on now with my COVID and Biden and Trump paper, now we have developed the technology. Now it's like, okay, let's try to see what we can do. And then I met uh, my uh, new interns, uh, Mukul and Venkatesh, who are co-authors in my uh, papers uh, related to uh, Hinduism. So uh, we have had a small subgroup and we we're having weekly meetings and they, they look at different PDF documents. There's a lot of data processing. Right. Uh, yes, and there's a lot of nitty gritty details, you know, and some of it, uh, I wouldn't know all the details in some of the code, but um, the reason uh, our, our approach is for our group is that all the projects, we will publish the code and the data with the paper okay. so that other people can extend. We want open uh, science. And uh, basically, yes, and these guys were brilliant. Uh, Venkatesh worked really hard uh, and he completed the project. And basically the idea was to use the sentiments expressed using Twitter because those sentiments were handleable by experts. So there were tweets and experts looked at the tweets and they said, if they said, happy, joking and whatnot. Yeah. And we used this, that data is our training data and then we took we trained we developed a natural language processing model yeah. empowered by deep learning uh, the BERT model which is developed uh, by Google you know so we took that or those placed everything together and then we got uh, the three translations of the Bhagavad Gita that we handpicked and the reason we picked this uh, we also explain it in the paper there's certain decades of gap between the translation yeah, yeah. Okay. And languages change. There are hundreds of translations out there, or maybe uh, it may be crossing a thousand, and probably more than a hundred prominent ones. And every now and then there's a translation. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we uh, completed the project, then I uh, was introduced to uh, Shushirat Bade ji from uh, Midam uh, Trust in uh, Pondicherry. And he did a translation of the Bhagavad Gita uh, where he has a, a rhyming translation, you know? So it has, so that's another thing, you know, you have the poetry is broken, yeah. the rhyming is gone. There's the, it's not a verse form anymore in all the translations, but Shushurat Bhate Bhaiji has done that there where he has maintained the rhyming pattern. And, uh, that was something that we want to look at in the future. And I am going to visit him in December and uh, now active with his uh, group there. And we are going to do a post study where we are going to take the, the sentiments that is expressed by 
the artificial intelligence models and then we are going to uh, have a qualitative assessments by uh, because uh, Bhaiji's uh, group uh, they are in Pondicherry he is teaching Bhagavad Gita to hundreds of people you know and they do a course and basically the, the people who know Bhagavad Gita will give them this text and we want to just know what type of sentiments they think it's being expressed so we want to comp do a paper on the man versus machine, basically. Oh, right. Yeah, how how AI sees things, how people see things, and there are a lot of limitations, yeah. challenges in this type of study. And we are now, I mean, one is ethics approval. The moment you get data from people, <laughs> so now we are yeah. going through that. And uh, with uh, with Mukul, uh, who, there's a second paper where we are comparing the. Bhagavad Gita with the uh, with the Upanishads, yeah. and uh, that paper published in PLOS One is more of topic modeling. So one is sentiment analysis. So NLP, natural language processing, has a number of uh, subcategories, and mm -hmm. so sentiments we want to know how well computers recognize emotions, yeah. and there's a lot of uh, you know advantages in that. You know we. If we if we know, computers know how we are expressing ourselves, then there can be better technologies developed to aid people. You know, so we usually get uh, call center people, you know, uh, people talking to call centers and getting upset. You know, sometimes you come into conversations, yeah. and you do not really know that you have become upset or the other person has become upset. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a app or something telling you or somehow there's some guidance then yeah. that can be avoiding a lot of problems you know in the world <laughs> so uh sentiment analysis is a good area so a right. uh, topic modeling we want to know what major topics are there in the bhagavad gita what are the major topics in the upanishads and how they are linking with each other because the bhagavad gita is known as the Gita Upanishad, Gita Upanishad, and uh, so on, seen as the 13th Upanishad, you know, which basically summarizes the whole 108 Upanishads. So, so we systematically using the artificial intelligence driven topic modeling approach, we basically compare them and we show which, uh, how it, the topics link with the, the two texts, you know, in between the two texts. So, but that is something that's done. And now, um, currently uh, in April this year, Google released the Sanskrit translator, the Google Translate engine, right? So uh, we are like now in the process of uh, another project that we are doing is evaluating, to, to evaluate how good is the Google Translator. Wonderful. So, yeah, so we, and actually like our framework that we are developing, it's very um, general. You can use it to evaluate any of the translators in Google. You know, there's a lot of translators in Google, but there's not much multidisciplinary project that people have written papers to really evaluate how good it is, you know, because there's, yeah. it's a tough thing to do. And uh, the other thing is, especially now countries like Australia and the developed countries, there used to be a lot of research grants given to, humanities social right. science back in the days but with the new the covid uh, and uh, the advancements of uh, technology and engineering the government is cutting all the grants you know so we have we basically have humanities uh, social sciences they are not having the grants to do this type of research you know mm -hmm. and employing people with ai background is very costly to do stuff like this you know right. So in terms of what, the way me and uh, uh, Shushrat Bhaiji from Midan Trust and these interns and are operating, it's all voluntary, you know, like it's not a thing that we must do. It's not something that will get me uh, promoted that I have to do this to, to get promotion because I have my basic research that I am doing already. And this is something like a weekend research thing, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so. Uh, and the thing is like, the other thing that motivated me into going into this area is because I've been talking to academics in Australia and generally when I'm moving around in conferences and I see that the Hindu academics are generally afraid to come out as Hindus, you know? And I think 
back uh, in the days this was okay but now we have like a huge population of youths who are basically feeling uh, feeling ashamed to be hindus you know and i think bringing uh, ai in philosophy of religion or hinduism basically will empower youths to say say ah uh, if uh, uh, a scientist is finding this interesting maybe there's something interesting yeah. in our text you know very true very true yeah. <laughs> So that's uh, another uh, goal. And in the future, to, uh, to promote that, in the future, I would want to have our own. Uh, so at Oxford University, there's a center for Hindu studies. At yes, UNSW, right. my dream project is to have our own center of UNSW center of Hindu studies, you know, and where these things will come about the research with the AI side, but we will do research in other aspects of Hinduism. We right. have yoga, we have our you know classical dances we have music and we have sanskrit we have translation project there's so much of things you know i mean hinduism is a one of the typically uh, probably the world's oldest it's the world's oldest living religion you know so it's yeah. the oldest living living religion and uh, there's a lot of things that have happened a lot of texts a lot of philosophers and a lot of aspects to study and it can be a whole department actually. And uh, some Western universities have been doing it. And unfortunately in India, this has been absent. And uh, and you do not have like your leading universities who have a center for Hindu studies or anything close to that, you know? And people, when they talk about their own religion and culture, people see that uh, as something that you shouldn't do that in an academic setting, but I, would like to challenge that. Why shouldn't we do it? Why shouldn't we uh, make our study of our Hindu culture more formal? Just as Egypt Egyptologists are there, why don't we have Hindulo yeah. Hindulogists? Or <laughs> another term we could say there, you know, a term can be developed there, you know, that basically focuses on, on our culture and religion, right? Yeah. There's a lot of beautiful things there that we want to show to the world. I want to motivate others so that it helps humanity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's very well put. I mean, there are a lot of endologists, uh, to be honest, who are working on a lot of uh, Indic culture and heritage. Yes. But like you said, there's uh, there's a misconception that goes around that you know science and religion can never come together. So for a scientist to do work on this it kind of puts uh, this misconception into you know it, it's it puts it aside. That's very good. I think, yes, that misconception has come about due to um, Abrahamic religions. Um, I, in the past, they have been quite anti-science with uh, uh, things in some of the texts written that are against science, but that is not true for Hindu texts, you know, and yeah. Hinduism has been always pro-science. We pro do not have, we do not have Hindu uh, monks or uh, sages or priests who come yeah. out and say, hey, do not go to a biology class. You know? Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. we do not have that kind of thing or do not yeah. believe go to a eighth science class, you know? So so those things, uh, Hinduism has been pro-science yeah. and some of the key uh, foundations of uh, science and technology that uh, a lot of people take for granted, it comes from Hinduism, you know? I mean, uh, for example, the decimal number system, it's a Hindu number system, you know, that we are using every day. The binary number system is developed yeah. by Pingala and he was a Hindu uh, sage, you know, Hindu philosopher. So we have uh, basically number system. I mean, uh, calculus goes back, back to India, you know, you have like the Kerala School of Mathematics, uh, 12th, yeah. 13th century established the foundations of calculus. So we want people to know that Hindus have been con contributing to science and technologies since the ancient days. And we want our population not to feel, uh, um, you know, ashamed of the culture and religion. And uh, to also, we want our population to actually understand their own culture and religion. They should, Hinduism, the thing is that the texts such as the Bhagavad Gita and Upanishads, they are all about dialogues. Right. Dialogues exactly. between the master and the student. And Absolutely. that's how a religion has evolved, right? Yeah. And we want these dialogues to continue about science, religion, and philosophy, for example. 
about where's uh, modern science and technology, the information age coming and where does religion and philosophy stand, you know? So these yeah. dialogues will actually, so Hinduism is not a religion that is like, oh, we had our prophet, we had our founder, now we won't have any more. That's yeah. this, uh, this is not ba the basis of Hinduism. Hinduism is that we will keep on having avatars of uh, Lord yeah. Krishna, of Lord Vishnu in forms as that's what's the, uh, the theme of the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. And uh, basically, we will also have evolution of our texts. And our texts are evol evolving. Uh, the religion is evolving. Uh, in the West, uh, uh, some of the concepts from Hinduism have taken many forms, uh, even all the way to Hollywood, inspired movies, inspired a new age uh, religious uh, groups, yeah. uh, spiritual groups, the yoga and uh, meditation culture that has done. So all these things are there. And uh, the thing is that we want uh, our population, uh, the Hindus, the youths to know where they stand and where is philosophy, where's mythology. Because we have a lot of Hindus being uh, told that, hey, your texts are myths. As in, people are like, oh, there's this myth busters, you know? So, you know, a text myth basically means something fake or something fairy tale, you know? They do not know the definition of myth. If you look at the definition of mythology, it is something to do with symbolic meaning behind uh, that is used in uh, texts such as poems and uh, narrative poetry. There's all this symbolic meaning that uh, have uh, philosophical foundations, you know? and we need people to understand that. And unless we basically have our text taught in languages, the philosophy behind them taught in languages, which is comprehending to people, and it could be local state languages in India, English and Western languages that people easily to understand. At the moment, we have like a huge translation issue. There's a translation bias. We have our main... Uh, uh, Puja ceremonies are in Sanskrit, you know, and there's not much translation about what the verses mean, for example. Yeah. Right. So we need to actually transform our religion. And the only way we can do all these things is that we need to bring Hinduism back to academia because Hinduism is a product of academia for thousands of years. Hinduism developed in academia. We have uh, the main key Vedas and the post Vedic texts women writers in academia have contributed to Hinduism. It was not that if you're women, you do not write texts. So we yeah. had women scientists, philosophers in ancient India, and we have them today now. And we need that whole tradition to follow where we have people contributing to the text and uh, evolving the texts further with the modern science and technology. So it is part of, so I envision that a future where uh, you will do a computer science degree with a <laughs> Hindu studies major, you know? So you can have yeah. a double major in Hindu studies and computer science and you can do all this stuff. Yeah. I'm talking to a, to a startup now in India, they are trying to have a virtual reality concept of temples, you know? So oh, some people awesome. are, yeah, some, uh, the, there are people from AI background, they are trying to do this. Okay. And uh, slowly, it is the computer scientists who have been, I mean, everybody has contributed, but these yeah. modern age, the computer scientists have really pushed the world, big changes to the world, you know? Yeah. And I think uh, computer scientists like me uh, will probably bring these changes back and we need, you know, we, we need uh, online uh, programs to understand more about our texts. We yeah. need formal degrees. And I hope that the Indian government with the Indian universities do far much more so yeah. that we can do these things, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to ask you this. Um, I mean, I'm a, I don't know anything about computer science, so you could probably explain this to me. Uh, you know, like, like there are hum like many versions of the Gita, there are many versions of Ramayana as a play in yeah. different, different parts of South Asia, India, Thailand, Bali, and many other places. So is there um, a way that AI can like, you know, work on how different or similar the plays are, like through, this is a video I'm talking about. So it's not a, it's not a written transcript. So through videos, is it possible to analyze uh, this? 
like do a similar um, work as what you've done now um if you are uh, so because the the plays are at the end of the day are based on uh, text so you could always do comparison of uh, the topics and the sentiments across those texts to see how similar or different they are you know so how do you compare two texts you know the comparison of two texts because the way you translated the same bhagavad gita and the way i will translate it we will say arrange words according in different ways right and if we are two decades or three decades apart then the yes. changes of words will be different and yeah. then if we are uh, like uh, using different languages then there will be more changes right, right. but the what ai is can only do is um, analyze what sentiments have been expressed in the verses or the text and compare how many of Uh, those different sentiments such as happy sad and things yeah, across yeah. the verses are and then what topics have been expressed by them you know so basically ai can help in comparing texts even of different languages with this approach because topics and sentiments these are universal things right yeah it doesn't matter which language you are looking at you can compare two different texts do i'll two different texts of two different uh, languages with sentiments basically it will give you some indication that uh, this is a horror uh, text yeah. this is a you know comedy text uh, or a movie screenplay so similar things can be done in the case of plays uh, in terms of plays you could always take scenes of plays and do some kind of a computer vision approach where you can identify different scenes what actions are being happening in the right. different scenes so there's a lot of research in artificial intelligence about you know action recognition you know to and to guide people or companies further like uh, just uh, yesterday i was looking at a short video on linkedin and it was saying uh, showing a you know a uh, garage uh, a workspace actually and people were doing all sorts of stuff and then the ai system was trying to recognize who's standing who's moving mm-hmm. if there's a fork fork lift moving what is the safety you know things like that so a lot of those technologies we can always bring into understanding place and uh, movies as well and also to filter content here for for our younger generations i mean That's- we have all had that experience where we are sitting with our parents and then we play some movie and yeah. then some scene comes about and then we we'll, are oh, yeah. comfortable and we can't find a remote now you know yeah. <laughs> and somebody runs away <laughs> so those things can be addressed by artificial intelligence you know we okay. parenting safe internet internet safety safe media and all those things artificial intelligence is going to address a lot of those things in the next 5 or 10 years a lot of things are already developed but it takes a while for people to actually adopt it or companies yeah. to really move them forward yeah yeah so, so like this is what i said you were uh, when you told me about the uh, how you train the model with so many sentiments from that you had picked out from during the pandemic time uh why particularly during the like the sentiment only that arose during the pandemic was there a reason behind it um actually so the thing with the the sentiment analysis is uh, uh, in artificial intelligence uh, models uh, it is you develop only model when you have data okay. for sentiment analysis the major data set is uh, there's the imdb data set and it just says negative sentiments and positive sentiments it gives okay. just a score between 0 minus 1 and 1 something like that right so if we use that we data set which we also use in our paper to show additional results we wouldn't know the different uh, distinct sentiments such as very sad or sad or happy and joking you know so those levels so now the thing is during covid there is this uh, sen wave data set released where 10000 tweets were hand labeled by uh, 50 experts okay. and there were 10 sentiments you know and these were multi label sentiments meaning that you can be sad and joking or happy and joking at the yeah. same time you know so you have two or three sentiments express one at once in a tweet you know so sometimes is one sentiment sometimes two sometimes can be three 
So it's a complex data set in terms of the multi-level sentiment. So our model basically uses that data set as a training so that for the different verses, we have sometimes one or two or three sentences predicted. So the reason we did this only with this data set is purely because uh, that it was available uh, for us. Otherwise, in order to have, like to actually have a better model, we need to do this thing where we are giving this uh, Bhagavad Gita Upanishad verses out to the public and seeing what sentiments they express. And then it would be that, it would be better that way. And then that is our model for training. And that model is then used for other Hindu related texts. So at the moment we're based on Twitter data set, which is current age. And the major limitation is those Hindu texts were translated from 1920s to all the way 1960s, right? So the language has changed a lot. So those things can be addressed when we create our own data sets, you know, and yeah, for training uh, such models. And these things can happen hopefully in the future, you know, and just creating the, the foundations and future we'll have PhD students and postdocs hopefully doing these things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we look forward to more such projects from you. That, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Varsha Ji. Thank you. Yeah. It, it was a lovely conversation, uh, Dr. Rodash. I, I really enjoyed this. And I was dreading a little bit because I have zero background on computer science. And I was like, okay, is, uh, I don't know about the technicalities. I don't know about the technical jargon. So I didn't know how to, uh, ex I didn't, like when I read about the, when I read the article, I was very fascinated as to how, how you did the whole work. And when you, uh, when I read the papers, I was very confused, <laughs> but it, it was really wonderful to have a uh, talk with yeah. you to understand yeah. this work better. By the way, those two papers uh, the, uh, on the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, okay. they are quite long papers, actually. Yeah, yeah. Like standard uh, computer science papers are shorter and in biology or other areas, they are like yeah. even half the size. So I've sent pap those papers to some of my friends and colleagues and they're like, uh -huh. whoa, you expect us to read this <laughs> big paper? I'm like, so, I, I mean, <laughs> my papers are usually very detailed and I'm like, we are talking about the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishad. We can't just yeah. do a rough job, you know, That's in true. the analysis, you know. We yeah. need to really work really hard. And I'm really thankful to Mukul and uh, Vinkatesh. Without their help, we couldn't have done all this, you know. And yeah. uh, also all the people who are supporting me. And thank you very much for choosing me for this. And I hopefully with this uh, interview, it will motivate more people to do research with us. Yeah, that's, that's the, yeah. fingers crossed. Maybe it was a long wait to have this talk, but it was it's definitely worth it. <laughs> worth the wait to have this talk with you. Okay, thank you. Okay, then uh, thank you so much. I'll just stop the recording. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.